Well, we're going to continue in uh, the book of Isaiah. We're on chapter 20, so we're making good progress. The whole chapter today. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, Isaiah chapter 20. <clears throat> in the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos. He said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped and barefoot. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away, stripped and barefoot, the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. Those who trusted in Cush and boasted in Egypt will be dismayed and put to shame. In that day, the people who live on the coast will say, see what has happened to those who we relied on, those who fled for help and deliverance from the king of Assyria. How then can we escape? May God add his blessing to this, his holy word. Do we know how to disarm the power of sin? How shall we escape such sin? Today we're going to look at the origins of sin, the nature of sin, and the presence of sin. But the message to Judah here is don't trust in ungodly nations. Don't compromise, or to put it another way, sin shames us. When we trust in ungodly things and compromise, we sin against God. A few weeks ago, we did the landmine of compromise and it's a dangerous thing for us to do. And when we tread on it, uh, it is very disabling. It's when we compromise the word of God to the word of this world. God asked Isaiah to be a sign to the people of Judah. Well, let's look at the politics that were playing out at the time. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, he came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it. This is the time when the Assyrians <coughs> conquered the Philistine city of Ashdod. And Isaiah's sign is of a coming judgment, and it showed them the shame of sin. Now, this is documented in uh, history books that the invasion of 711 BC is uh, a factual war, a factual battle, and Ashdod, it, we've got records of it happening. The Philistines were both neighbors and they were also thorns in Israel's side. And the fall of Ashdod would certainly make Judah think, we're next. We need protection. But where were they going to get that protection? Where do you go when things look bleak? When things are threatening and you're worried, where do you go? Well, they were considering, as we've looked in previous chapters, signing alliances with Egypt and Cush to get their protection. And so at this time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, son of Amos, and he said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so going around stripped and barefoot. This was the sign that God wanted to show to Judah that Isaiah would be this sign. It would be a physical sign. He would be naked and barefoot. And that would be a sign of shame. 
He was wearing an outer garment of sackcloth, which indicated clothes of mourning. Mourning for Israel and for Judah because of their sin. You remember when we were doing the uh, Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew 5, it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. And when we looked at that, we looked at what Jesus was actually teaching there. He was really teaching that those who mourn the sin that separates us from God brings us to that point of repentance. We should hate the sin that causes us to hurt him. It should shame us before Almighty God. We need to take sin very seriously, for it brings shame upon us. What God is saying here is that we are moving to the next level. Uh, Take off the sackcloth and take off your sandals. Now, the sandals were a sign of, uh, taking them off was a sign uh, of slavery. Uh, What they would tend to do is if they captured anybody, they would make sure that they were barefoot because if you're barefoot, you couldn't easily run away, especially on the very gravelly, stony ground that was there. A, A slave can't run in bare feet. And God is saying, no one is listening, so I'm going to show you what the shame of sin looks like. You remember, God has been warning Judah, warning Judah, spoken to King Ahaz, and told them that if they don't trust in God, but they trust in the worldly alliances, then they will fall. And God sometimes tells his prophets to add to their word a visible sign to wake people up and to get serious about God. Isaiah was stripped, but we shouldn't think that he was nude. He wasn't completely without clothing. Instead, he would have worn uh, his inner garments customary in uh, the day, like wearing your underwear or a nightshirt. The message wasn't about nudity, It was about complete poverty and humiliation and shame. Isaiah dressed as the poorest and most destitute would dress. He was naked. This is a powerful chapter, and it's really a parable to us. Isaiah is a living, breathing parable. He's going to live this out before his people for three years. And the meaning of the sign announces the judgment of humiliation on Egypt and Cush. Isaiah is living out that there is a coming judgment. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and portent against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead the way stripped and barefoot the Egyptians, the Egyptian captives and Cushite exiles, young and old, with buttocks bared to Egypt's shame. Under the command of the Lord, Isaiah dressed in this poor and humble way for three years. And it was a message against Egypt because the king of Assyria would lead away the Egyptians as prisoners. It was to show Judah their shame in placing their trust in Egypt and Cush. As the Assyrians took the Egyptians captive, they would humiliate them by stripping them and leading them away as prisoners. And that would be a shame on Egypt. And if you look back at 2 Samuel chapter 10, Hanan the Ammonite shaved off half of David's men's beards and cut off their garments at the buttocks to send them away. And this was to humiliate them and to shame them. This sign was to Judah and to show them their shame in not trusting God for their protection. It's when we look at this and we recognize that actually we're naked before God. We cannot hide anything from God. It's quite a 
quite a, a, a thought, isn't it? Nothing you've done, past, present, future, could be hid from God. Are you thinking of the things that you would quite like to hide from God just now as I'm speaking? What's the thing that would pop into your mind that you think, oh, I really wouldn't want anybody to see that? Something that you've done, something that you've thought, some action you took that you later regretted, but it's going to be exposed. You're going to stand naked before God and all your deeds, all your deeds will be exposed before Almighty God. How does that make you feel this morning? Do you feel chipper about that? No. <laughs> no. Well, we've, we've got a special thing where the, up on the screen we're going to bring... <laughs> We're just going to go through everybody and bring it up on the screen. Uh, man, that's why when we stand before God, our plea is in Christ Jesus because he covers our nakedness with his righteousness. That is the best news, folks, that you can ever hear this morning. You stand naked before God so he sees every deed, every action, every thought that you've ever had and Christ covers you with his righteousness. I think that's beautiful. If you are outside of Christ, if you don't have Christ in, in your life, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, if you've always held him far off, then you stand naked before God and he sees everything and he judges everything. That is frightening. And this chapter here is showing, it's a parable and, and Isaiah has become this parable to show the nation of Judah their sinfulness. He's saying, look, I'm exposed to you all as you will be exposed to God. Trust in him. Be covered by him, not by your fear and you looking into uh, alliances with Egypt and Cush. Because Egypt and Cush are going to come under judgment. So why would you do that? Why would you sign an alliance, an allegiance with uh, a country that is going to come under judgment? When God judges Ethiopia and Egypt, it will be clear how foolish it was for Judah to look to them for protection. Whenever we put our faith in something that's wrong, the Lord will find a way to make it disappoint us. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I know this is uh, like baby Christian talk, but uh, to check out if you're in the will of God, uh, I would always pray a prayer and say, uh, formulate the prayer. And, uh, if we're intended to go and do this, but if, but if it's not your will, disturb my peace. We should know the will of the Lord. But it was my way of saying, well, there's going to have to be some sort of mechanism to, to be able to work it out. And when he disturbs your peace, but the thing you were praying about you wanted, and you ignore that, disturbance of the peace and you go ahead with it, then it causes problems and disappointments. I remember, uh, Alison was sharing on Wednesday night about the car accident we had. We had an, a Pajero and it, uh, we were on the motorway and it, and it started to break down and we put our hazards on and a McBurney's lorry hit it. 
But what happened before that is I prayed and asked God, should I buy that car? And my peace was disturbed, but I still went ahead and bought the car. And then God said, all right, okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll get rid of it for you. Boom, McBurney's lorry wiped it out, car gone. Why do I know that I am? Because I felt it. Because I knew I'd gone against what God had told me to do. And he destroyed it. And that's what uh, is saying here. Whenever we put our faith in something that is wrong, so we ask God, God tells us, and then we go ahead and do it anyway, then we will be disappointed by it. It will come back and bite us. Judah set their faith in Ethiopia and Egypt, but now they're left afraid and ashamed. You see, there's no place of security for the people of God other than that which is found in the rule of God. We need to get this. We need, really need to understand this. Our security is only in God. That's the only place we can find security. We cannot find security in this world because this world will always let us down. And all faith not centered in God is doomed to disappointment. It's, it's really wood, hay, and stubble. But in the car's sense, it ended up in a scrapyard. But it's a good illustration. If you think about our lives, whenever we do things that are generated from the flesh, from a worldly perspective, that's influenced from the world and leads us to do things rather than from the spirit, and we go and do those things, it can be good things that we're doing. It doesn't have to be a bad thing we're doing. It could be a good thing we're doing but it's not of God, then it's wood, hay, and stubble. It's a car wreck, and it ends up in the scrapyard. And that's really what Isaiah's saying here to Judah. If you put your trust in Ethiopia and, uh, and Egypt, it's going to end up as a wreck because I am going to judge them. I'm bringing them under judgment how shall we escape? Well, the Lord allowed Judah to be backed into a corner caught between two mighty empires, Egypt and Assyria, without being able to trust either one of them. There was no escape. Have you been in that place? Have you been in the place where there is no escape? where you're between a rock and a hard place. We have. We were facing bankruptcy. The house was going to be repossessed. We'd knocked out, we were going to build an extension, so we'd actually knocked the back of the house, two years with no wall at the back of the house, because we hadn't got any money, and two very small children. God placed us in a place where we couldn't sell the house and get out, and we didn't know how to go forward because I no longer had a job. I was between a rock and a hard place. That was the best place I could possibly have been because I gave my life. I wouldn't be here today if that hadn't happened. I'd probably be on a yacht somewhere in the Mediterranean, <laughs> being miserable. <laughs> but you know something? God squeezed me out of me at that point, and I'd made such a mess of it. I was out of control. I didn't know what to do, and I turned my life over to him. How shall we escape? I turned my life over to him. I said, I've made such a mess of it. I'm going to give you my life now. With the free reign to do with my life, whatever is your will. That was in July 1991. And that's the only reason I'm standing here today. There was no escape except in the Lord. There was no escape except in the Lord. 
So how shall we escape when sin shames us, when we are made naked before God? Well, let's have a look at the origins of sin. The meaning of sin is to go off course, to miss the target, or to fall short. And most of us think sin started in the Garden of uh, Eden with Adam and Eve, but it goes way back beyond that. If we look at Ezekiel 28, verses 12 to 17, Lucifer sinned and was cast out. The first act of sin was in the spiritual realm. And then in Genesis 4, 7, it says, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must roll over it. We must resist sin and fight against it. In John 8 and 43, it says, why is my language not clear to you? This is Jesus speaking. Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Sin keeps us from God. But we have to take on board what Paul advises in Romans 6 and 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. We can fight against sin. And boy, I, from personal experience, I can tell you, you have to fight against sin. You can't lie down to it. And it is a battle. It's a battle of the mind. And you have to be strong in the battle in order to beat it. Don't leave the door open to sin. For it's crouching at the door ready to have you. But to all too often we open the door to sin. When we allow the thoughts to become actions. The time to catch it is when it's only a thought. And you need to ditch the thought and change your mind to what Christ would have you do, what Christ would think. Every thought needs to be taken captive and placed before Christ. That's how you protect yourself against sin. We need to be so different from the world. We are a holy people, and therefore we should live holy lives, not compromised by sin. And do you know something? When we make that decision to live holy lives, when we repent of our sin and we get right with God, that's where revival starts. You know, revival starts in us. Revival starts in this church. Revival starts with the individuals in this church living a holy life. That is so radically different from the way the world is living that it kicks off a fire that cannot be quenched because the Holy Spirit is on board. When God's people sell out to him fully, and the world sees that we are different. The trouble is that the world looks on us and they don't see anything different. They just see us as them. There's no difference in us. And they're not attracted by that. But if we have the victory, in Romans 6, 6 to 8, it says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The moment you trust in Jesus, the old nature is dead. The moment, the split second you trust in Jesus, the old nature is dead. You just need to put it to death. When did Rod die? Well, I died on the 24th of March, 1991. And when was I born again? The 24th of March, 1991. That night, I died and I lived <laughs> simultaneously. I have to remember that sin has no power over me because of what Jesus has done for me. And we have to resist 
The best prayer to pray, Lord, I'm yours, fill me with your spirit. Have mercy upon my soul. Fill me with your spirit. So when temptation is crouching at the door, when it's knocking at the door, ask to be filled with the spirit. Ask for God's mercy. What we're going to do, we're going to fight it. Greater is he that is in me, in 1 John 4 and 4. We've allowed sin to dictate our lives. We've made wrong decisions. We've trusted in people. And now we find ourselves bankrupt. Our trust has been in the wrong place. Judah's trust was in Egypt and Ethiopia. Isaiah is naked, showing them the shame of sin. He is living a living picture of sin's shame. And only God can save them. Only God can save us. Only God We make mistakes when we make alliances with other people. And when a nation forgets God, it's never good. Scotland has forgotten God, and it's not good. So how shall we escape? Confess your sin one to another, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We must repent. Do it now. Forsake sin and ask for forgiveness before God exposes it to everyone. There's a thought for us, isn't it? If you are wittingly sinning in some area of your life, God can expose it to everyone. Do we want that? Or do you want to keep it private? Do you want to keep it secret? The trouble is with God... He'll bring it to the front. Well, the nature of sin. Remember, there are powers at work that are trying to destroy us and our church and our families. Satan wants to destroy, and he's a liar. We all have desires that are linked to our flesh, that are designed to draw us away, and that never stop. Have you thought about this? Desires of the flesh. Because I'm going to ask you what they are. Right. Right, I'm going to ask you. (laughs) Not out loud. (laughs) But what's a good thing to do is write down the top three desires of the flesh. Write it down. Just write them down. Because it will prepare you for the attack. Satan will always come and attack you at the point where you're weakest. The point where you're weakest is where you desire most from the flesh. Right? So why not give it some thought and write them down and put them in your wallet? Because you don't go there very often. (laughs) But it's a secret, please. (laughs) Um, write them down because we need to know we're in a battle and that's where Satan's going to come in. So if you're aware of it, if you're aware that that's your weak areas, then you'll be on guard in those areas. You know, Satan will always say, it's okay, go on, jump in. It's fun. It's fun. And it's exciting. Go on, just do it. God doesn't mind. God doesn't even know about it. And nobody needs to know about it. And he'll say, surely God didn't say. And then when you cross the line, he quickly turns to the accuser And he tells that you're a dirty sinner and that God will not forgive you and that you're doomed and that you're wrecked. Satan tells you to do everything until the point you cross the line and then he's the great accuser and he makes you guilty and God can never use you and God will never use you and you've let him down so bad you don't deserve heaven. That's what Satan does. 
And lastly, the presence of sin. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. The thing we need to remember is, ready? This is the thing we need to remember. You ready for this? Don't feed the flesh. Have you got it? Ready? All together then. Don't feed the flesh. Keep, do it as a mantra. Don't feed the flesh. It's so important. If you've made the list of the three desires of the flesh, don't feed them. <laughs> feed the spirit. Don't, you know, C.S. Lewis with the two dogs, wasn't it? There was, uh, there was a bad dog and good dog. And it depends which one you fed was going to win the battle. Don't feed the bad dog. Don't put into your brain the things that are not good for it. Put in spiritual things. Put in good things. Put in honest things. Put in wholesome things. You put the television on at night, switch it off. <laughs> because there's nothing good on it. It just feeds the wrong side. It feeds the wrong, feeds the flesh. So be very careful. Don't feed the flesh. So how shall we escape? Stay close to Jesus. Pray every day for the power of the Spirit to keep you from temptation. And when it comes crouching at the door, be ready to run from it. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. We need to be honest about our fleshly desires so that we can be ready to fight against them. And we shouldn't be fighting alone. But get people to pray for you. Who here is praying for a brother or sister in Christ who has told them about the desires of the flesh to pray a guard over them? Who's doing that? Because we should. We should be praying for each other. Remember, we are naked before God and can hide nothing. Judah had succumbed to the desires for worldly protection, and Isaiah was a living example as to their shame, for sin shames us. They cried, how shall we escape? And the answer is, fight against Satan's lies and pray for the spirit to resist. Fight, 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 for we have the victory in Christ Jesus, and that is our only way of escape. That is our only way of escape. If you think you can do it in the flesh, you can't. You cannot battle against Satan in the flesh, for you will lose. The only way of escape that we have is in Christ Jesus, and we need to fight for it. Don't feed the flesh. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, that we are naked before you, that there's nothing we can hide from you, that you know that we fall short on so many things, that we do have desires of the flesh, but we need to put them to death. Lord, we can only do that by taking the victory that you've given us in Christ Jesus by prayer meditation by being in your presence, by trusting in you for everything, by getting alongside other Christians to pray with you. Lord, this is a battlefront. This is a major battle, and it's a battle for the soul. And so, Lord, we would ask that you would be present with each one of us, that we would really not feed the flesh, but we would feed the spirit that, was, that is within us. And in doing so, you do give us the victory over our sins. And so, Lord, bless us and keep us in a very special way. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.